Chalk History Festival special series on history with Jackson. Hello and welcome to History of Jackson, the home of accessible and digestible history. And welcome to our Chalk History Festival special series. We'll be talking to some of the historians, living historians and performers here at Chalk about what they're doing at the festival and their work. Now, Chalk History Festival will be covered comprehensively through History of Jackson, be it on our social media, our blog, and our podcast. So if you wanted to check out more and learn more about what's happening at Chalk, do head to the links in the description below. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you to our Chalk History Festival special series episode. Hello and welcome to our Chalk History Festival special series. And here on History of Jackson, I've done that every interview so far and finally messed up on the last day. But we're joined by Dr. Rob Lyman. How are you doing, Rob? I'm doing very well. I'm delighted to be here eventually because we've tried, <laughs> we've, we've tried to get an, um, a meeting all week, haven't we? Yes, and I'm, I'm so glad we're getting to you on the final day. <laughs> we, we couldn't possibly have left without having this chat, but uh, it's good to see you. It's good to see you out and about with some really, really big names historians this week. Bethany Hughes, oh, I see yes. this morning. Uh, that's the joy of Chalk. I think Chalk has so many different people coming from the high and the low of the history world there is no such thing as the <laughs> low in the history world you know what i mean but really really popular narrative historians and people like me who might sell a couple of hundred books on very specialist subjects so it's uh it's great to be here and of course there's a whole mix isn't there there's yes. military history and uh, cultural history and social history actually i always say that about military history it's got everything it's a history of people at war what's not to like Exactly. I think military story, history is fantastic. Yeah. And we've had such a breadth here as well. Like you said, we've gone from ancient history yeah. to even stuff about 2024, which is Quite remarkable, which is actually. Cool. Is. Well, anything that happened today is history, of course. That's the great thing about historians. And I think the other really interesting thing about history is I had some really interesting um, uh, conversations with archaeologists because archaeologists, prehistory, uh, and it's really, really remarkable. We're all human beings. We live one lifespan. Uh, and yet we're represented throughout history. And being able to investigate the past is amazing. We all have our specialisms, of course. And we've all got stuck for one reason or another in one or one part of history. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't mean we don't like the rest of it. I was actually trained as a medieval ecclesiastical historian. So oh. my, my origins are the history of the English church. And I still love it. I absolutely love it. So take me to a cathedral any day. Take me to a, an archaeological site or to a ruined abbey. And, and I'm, I'm your man. But... That's not what uh, I do now. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a modern <laughs> military historian. I, the other thing about this is that um, I'm writing another book with Richard Dunn at the moment. And as, as we're writing, we're, we're saying to ourselves, it's quite remarkable how every generation has to relearn the, the, um, the lessons that previous generations have learned and suffered by. Uh, and yet that's maybe something to do with the human condition. We don't like consuming the past. We don't like learning from the past. We're, we're sort of fated to live our experiences all over again, make those mistakes, learn those lessons. So last year we wrote this book, uh, Victory to Defeat, which is the story of the British Army between the First World War and the Second. We asked the question, why was the British Army so successful in 1918 and not so successful in 1940? Uh, and the fact of the matter is that uh, we, we made a whole series of mistakes that, believe it or not, we started making again in 1945. We disarmed. We thought that that war that had just passed would be the end of all wars. And we'd all um, enter those sunlit uplands uh, that Winston Churchill spoke about, and uh, all would be wonderful, and we'd never have to go back to war again. Well, within five years, we were involved in a very, very ble uh, messy, bloody war in Korea, which is the subject of a little shameless book plug here, oh, Jackson. No, you've got to get, it, you've got to get <laughs> For the new book, which is hopefully coming out on the 25th of June next year, once we finish writing it. <laughs> and that's always a task, isn't it? You have these, these lovely events where you end up procrastinating and not writing. <laughs> This week has been a bit of a disaster on the writing front. You may, you may not believe it, but when we finished uh, on, in the Geidel tent and wandering around this incredible festival every day, I go home and do a couple of hours on the book, okay. which is quite hard because that tends to coincide with a nice glass of wine. Uh, and of course, all the chit-chat from the Geidel folk who are staying with us in our Airbnb. 
and it's hard to get focused. But I'm I'm refighting the battles of early July 1950 at the moment in Korea. It's a very tragic, sad story for the American army, which suddenly realized that um, uh, they were relearning that old lesson that combat needs to be learned in times of peace. If you start trying to learn the art of combat in times of war, you're too late. And uh, and that's what I'm talking about in terms of lessons. And it's it's fascinating how societies, our current society is almost exactly in the same condition. We uh, we don't think there'll be another war, so we don't prepare for it. No, I, t- I totally agree. And it kind of reminds me of what Tim Boovery was saying on the podcast the other day, was we learn the wrong lessons. Of course we history. do. Of course. We, we, we learn the lessons that we think we need to learn. I mean, we're all human beings. We are very selective in our imaginings. Imagination is a word as a historian I use a lot. Um, going back to that book, Victory to Defeat, the people in the 1920s who are making decisions about our future failed to imagine the possibilities that were outside their purview. We like to think about, we like to be in control of our future in terms of, and, and we think about them, but the future doesn't come at us in the way that we imagine. We have to imagine other possibilities. And that's that's the job for all of us. And it's really incredible how, um, it's really important for our society as a whole and for our government in particular to be imagineers. And I'm afraid I don't think we've been doing that in the last few years. War shouldn't take us by surprise. No, so it's been a it's been a constant theme in the history of uh, humanity. It has, sadly. But the the tents that we're in today, uh, we're in the Guidal tent, which is absolutely lovely. You've got branded cushions, you've got branded umbrellas, and we've also got this map behind us. So what is Guidal? Guidal is a new app designed and financed by many of the chalk historians. About 21 of us have thrown a bit of money in. Our aim is to create an app that enables us to tell you, uh, in short audio snippets, about our favorite places. So if you go to a town or a village or a battle site or a castle, there's Tom Holland or Mary Baird or Rob Lyman or anyone else giving you two or three minutes of what that place uh, means to them. Uh, So often we go to places, history is all around us, and we leave none the wiser. And of course, when you go to a place, you've either got a, um, we've got the story stock uh, tent next to us. So there might be a little bit of ambient noise. Don't worry about it. But um, we go to a place, we've either got a guidebook or a guide. Many times, of course, we have neither. And the idea of the guide lab is that we've got something in our pocket that brings the area to life. Now, the real challenge is we can't do it on our own. There's no way that, and the app is global, by the way, that we can cover the whole world uh, with guidals of our own, of our favorite places. So that's where you come in, Jackson, and everyone else who's listening to this, because we want you to upload your own guidals, G-U-I-D-L. Go to our website, www.guidal.tours, register. We'll send you the software to download onto your laptop. You can create your own uh, audio snapshots of places. It's, we designed it for Tom Holland. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so it's very, very simple. <laughs> well, no, I, I thought having talked to you about the app a few times and Guidal and listened to you talk about it in the the Tech Evolution talk that you did later yeah. this week, earlier this week, I've been fascinated by by the idea because so often I do totally agree. So often we go to some of these places, and yeah. the signs are not comprehensive enough yeah. to teachers, yeah. and we're all on our phones anyway. Well, the, the real challenge, if you go to lots and lots of sites around the UK, there is often a lovely sign at the front. Certainly, uh, English Heritage done a really good job, but once you leave that. You've got no access. It's not anchored in your memory. It's not anchored in what we describe as your reality. Your reality is what's happening to you as you walk through the site. So that's where audio guides come in. So you can have someone at a castle, and we've got loads of guidals up now or battlefields, where people um, like Julian Humphreys and um, um, Charles Eastdale will take you through the battle step by step. And you can choose to go from one guide. Guidal is two, three, four minutes long. Uh, you can choose to stop them. You can choose to pick and choose. You can go and have a coffee yeah. <laughs> and listen to them whilst you're having a coffee. It's not a forced tour. It's uh, You can pick and choose. You can go around and, and do what you like. But you actually have someone who knows something about that site telling you about it. There's a lovely, lovely series of um, guidals that I noticed come up this week by 
a wonderful London artist called Kate Lovegrove, and she's done 17 guidals of the artist of Cheney Walk. And I sat there in bed on a Sunday morning when I tend to listen to the new guidals that have come in the previous day, and I listened to what, there was 96 minutes. Oh, wow. But uh, there are 17 of them, and I could either walk through Cheney Walk and listen to JMW Turner was there, quite extraordinary. Kate's uh, an artist, her father-in-law is a famous artist, Ramos, and um, this is a wonderful way for us to learn about the artist, Cheney Walk. I can consume them, all 17 in a, in a row if I wanted, <laughs> or I can sit in a cafe, I can exclude some of them. I can. It's like buying a book, Jackson, so you can buy a guide all for four ninety nine or five ninety nine. The highest price is nine ninety nine. The price is set by the guide all creator. So buy a guide all tour for four ninety nine. It's a book. You can keep it forever. You can open each chapter whenever you like. Each chapter is the guide all. I, I really like that idea, but it's it's changing the way we digest history. It is. And and it's moving away from books. Yeah. And it's it's leaning into the whole tech yeah. aspect yep. too. Yeah. What why do we need to change the way we disseminate and digest well history. i don't think we're changing it all we're doing is we're giving uh historians in particular and guides uh and anyone who talks about history uh anyone who talks about history intelligently i sourced and so on that finds a historian is a historian you're not a historian simply because you produced a book or because like me and many others you've got a yeah. phd in it uh history must not be exclusionary and what technology has given all of us historians is a new way to um to disseminate our stories to get our message across um not very long ago um history was exclusively written very little history was oral and oral history was actually just described as um uh, a recording the histories of people. Now we have now verbal history, not oral history, verbal history, which is verbalizing the words that we historians have created. So when a book is now produced, we can read the book, we can listen to the book on, uh, on audio book, like Audible, or we can hear it via guidals in a guidal tour. So I'm hoping we're going to get to the point where in due course, uh, all the books that are history books that are published will come with an audio book and a guidal because it makes sense and it, you can take you can take um, people around your story uh, uh, as a as a guide as a guide creator yeah. oh that's 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 an amazing idea and I, I think that it's something that will really add to the experience of digesting exactly and, exactly and improve people's immersion in yep. their in their books exactly exactly so I've got a final fun yep. question for you yep. Rob. you've been at chalk history festival all week yep You've been roasting and baking in the sun, but what has been your favourite thing that you've gone, seen, heard, listened to, or been involved with? Because you have been involved in some talks. I've well. been involved in a few talks. Well, uh, well, there are a number of things. There's not one <laughs> single thing. I think I would describe chalk as a, a multi-sensory experience. Oh, it certainly is. And I've loved getting involved with the writer Hannah Watson, who... Um, has launched her, uh, her book, The Jungle War, next door in the Story Stock Tent. And we talked to lots of young children about that earlier in the week. And uh, you interviewed Hannah, and it was really, really exciting. Um, I loved that. I loved giving my own talk, to be, uh, to be brutally honest, standing there in front of 800 people <laughs> in the Hiscock Tent talking about my new look at the Japanese command decisions that led to one of their biggest disasters in the Second World War, uh, which is the subject of a book I'm publishing, twenty or writing in 2026. It'll probably come out the year after. It's hugely satisfying for a, for a writing. Writing is a horribly solitary experience. You're stuck in a dusty archive, surrounded by books for very, very long periods of the day, and being able to come out and basically to take the week off and talk to people about history. Oh, it's just what we all love and what and why we do it. And I love people coming to me and saying, Rob thank you very much for writing that book i loved it and um and seeing other historians coming up and saying rob that book um first victory about the war in iraq iran and um syria which you wrote in 2006 thank you for that that, that happened to be this week and i wrote oh, it a wow. long time ago um that's really really wonderful i most of all what do i like about chalk valley i love people enjoying it we're gonna have we will have had twenty five thousand people this oh, week, wow. um, selling, and they would have sold up over 50,000 tickets to individual talks. So that's, you know, four talks, uh, two talks a person. It's really quite extraordinary when about 700 kids are coming 
this week, 700 children. They're all enjoying it as well. So it's history for young and old um, uh, from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the pre-age, uh, pre-human age to 2024. And we're seriously, what isn't there to like about this place? No, I, I organized my whole year around coming to Chalk. Uh, I just love it. And that really gave a scale of just how big and awesome Chalk is, to be honest. Exactly, exactly. And it's going from strength to strength. It's only been going 12, 13 years. And it began uh, with very um, small, uh, it was very small in every respect. But it's very interesting. The other thing is the number of historians, narrative historians, you're really serious people who want to come to Chalk, but there's no room for them. So I feel I feel very privileged to be here, and it's very exciting to be uh, to participate. Well, I I know I've seen so many people come out of your talk and go, "That was awesome." So I think Fabulous. you've done very well. Fabulous, thank you, Jackson. That's kind. Now, if people want to go away and listen to your work or read your work or even get you, get themselves on Guidel, how can they do that? Well, in terms of Guidel. Um, Download the app on the App Store, the Play Store, G-U-I-D-L. We'll get the, get the app. Do that in the first instance and play with it and see what historians are doing. And um, then think about your the role you could play in uploading your own guidelines. In terms of own, my own work, I'm on Twitter. I'm on um, Substack. Uh, my, the big book that I published with General Lord Dennett last year, Victory to Defeat, is uh, getting nice, healthy reviews and... Um, We've earned out our advance. That's the most important <laughs> thing. Um, my work in the Far East, A War of Empires, is the big book where I pulled all my arguments together. I am going back to it next year. I'm going to write a big book on the uh, uh, the, uh, the Battle of Kahima. It will be a big book because I don't think historians have got it completely right in terms of the Japanese decision. So I'll be re-looking at that battle. Not enough people have studied it. There's still a lot of work to do on, on that. You can find me on my website, um, robertlyman.com, and in any good bookshop. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure the links for all of them in the description below so people Fabulous. can go away and find them. Fabulous. Thank you very Fabulous. Much, Jackson, thank you very much indeed.